As I told you last week, chapter 48 contains information that's vital to understanding the Old Testament. In fact, hopefully uh, you'll pull out a pen because I'm going to give you certain keys that will unlock some of the mysteries in the Old Testament. In fact, how many of you have been Christians for more than 40 years? I promise you tonight you're going to learn some things. And you're going to think, my, why didn't I know that? That makes things so easy and so simple. But anyways, I just want to encourage you to pull out a pen, get ready to take notes, write down some of the verses that I'm going to be giving you. But before we pick up where we left off last week, let me explain a few things. Jacob had 12 sons, and you can find those 12 sons listed in Genesis chapter 35, verses 23 through 26. We're not going to go there. I'm just going to quickly go through them. He had six sons with Leah. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. He had two with Zelpah, who was uh, Leah's handmaiden, and that was Gad and Asher. He had two with Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin, and he had two with Bilhah, who was Rachel's handmaiden, which was Dan and Naphtali. Now, if you grew up in Oklahoma, and probably anywhere in America, you've heard that pronounced Naphtali. How many of you grew up hearing it, Naphtali? Well, if you travel to Israel... You'll meet several people who are named Naphtali, and they're from the tribe of Naphtali, and they will laugh at you because they know that in America we pronounce it that way, but it's actually Naphtali. So altogether, Jacob had 12 sons, and their descendants made up what is known as the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, let me show you why Israel was made up of 12 tribes rather than just one big group of people known as the nation of Israel. Look with me, if you would, in Genesis chapter 48. Let's read verses 3 and 4. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Lutz in the land of Canaan and blessed me. He said to me, I will make you fruitful and I will multiply your descendants. I will make you a multitude of nations. And I will give this land of Canaan to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. Now, I want you to underline the word multitude. God told Jacob, I will make you a multitude of nations. The word multitude was translated from the Hebrew word kahal, which means community, alliance, or assembly. In fact, I want you to notice how the NIV translates this. Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Lutz in the land of Canaan, and there he blessed me. And he said to me, I am going to make you fruitful and increase your numbers. I will make you a community of nations, an alliance of nations, and I will give this land as an everlasting possession to your descendants after you. So in essence, the descendants of each of Jacob's sons became its own tribe or nation. Now, to help you understand the concept of a tribe being considered a nation, let's talk about Native American Indians. How many of you are from the Cherokee tribe? All right, let me ask you a question. Is the tribe a nation? Yes, it's the Cherokee Nation. How many of you are from the Choctaw tribe? No one? I thought, okay, have a few from the Choctaw tribe. It's the tribe a nation. Yes, it's the Choctaw Nation. Same thing with the Creeks, the Chickasaw, and the Seminoles. I use those tribes because of the five civilized tribes. Those three tribes are also considered to be nations, and it was the same way with Israel. The nation of Israel was made up of an alliance of 12 tribes. And that's why Israel was referred to as the 12 tribes of Israel. But each tribe was considered to be its own nation, fulfilling the promise that God made to Jacob to make him a multitude of nations. Now, does everyone get that? Israel was an alliance of tribes. It was a multitude of nations. That's very important. And you're going to see why in just a minute. Now, in Genesis chapter 48, Jacob adopted Joseph's two oldest sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and he gave them all the rights and privileges of his own sons, which meant that Manasseh and Ephraim's descendants became tribes also, with each receiving an inheritance of land. Now, as I told you last week, this was a great honor for Joseph. You see, as the recipient of the birthright, he was supposed to receive a double portion of the inheritance. But rather than giving him a double portion, Jacob divided it between his two oldest sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So instead of there being one tribe known as the tribe of Joseph, there were two tribes representing Joseph. The tribe of Manasseh 
in the tribe of Ephraim. So Joseph actually had two tribes representing him. And from the Old Testament on, from this period on, those two tribes will be referred to as what? The house of Joseph. So as you go through the Old Testament, you will find this phrase, the house of Joseph. It's referring to the tribes of Manasseh and the tribe of Ephraim. Everyone with me? Now, to be honest with you, the math tends to confuse some people when it comes to counting the tribes, unless you know what you're doing. In fact, let's do the math. How many sons did Jacob have with Leah? Six. How many did he have with Zilpah, which was her handmaiden? Two. How many did he have with Rachel? Two. How many did he have with, with uh, Bilhah? Two. How many does that add up to? Twelve. Six plus two is eight plus two is ten plus two is twelve. So he had twelve sons in all. But Jacob adopted two of Joseph's sons as his own. Manasseh and Ephraim. And they received an apportion, a, a portion of land. They've got their own allotment. So we need to add those two to the tribes or to the sons. So how many sons did he have? When he adopted them. Fourteen. Now we're talking about tribes here. Because Manasseh and Ephraim received Joseph's portion. Then we have to take out Joseph. Right? Because he did. we don't have a tribe of Joseph. In his place we have the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim. So if we take out Joseph. We're going to subtract one. And what does that leave us? Thirteen. So how many tribes should there be? Thirteen tribes? How many? Twelve. Why? What's the deal? Could God not count? I mean, let's be honest. Are there mistakes in the Bible? We can clearly add them up. Six plus two is eight plus two is ten plus two is twelve. We have tw twelve here. He adopted Joseph's sons. They became as his own. We add those two and we have fourteen. Oh, we've got to subtract Joseph. So now we have 13. How in the world can it be referred to as the 12 tribes of Israel? Does anyone know? It goes back to nations. Remember, Levi did not receive an inheritance of land. And technically, let's go all the way back when we were studying Abraham. Technically, to qualify as a nation, you must have a homeland. No land. No nation. I'm not trying to uh, cause any trouble, but how many of you are from the Ketua tribe? You fought for land. Why? No land, no nation. So even though the Levites are considered a tribe, technically they are not a nation. Therefore, they are never counted as one of the 12 tribes of Israel. If they were, it would be the 13 tribes. But their inheritance is not land. Their inheritance is the Lord. No land, no nation. Therefore, Israel is made up of 12 nations. Look at Numbers chapter 18, verses 20 through 21. And the Lord said to Aaron, You priests will receive no allotment of land or share of property among the people of Israel. I am your share, and I am your allotment. As for the tribe of Levi, your relatives, I will compensate them for their service in the tabernacle. Instead of an allotment of land, I will give them the tithes from the entire land of Israel. So all of the other nations will tithe to the tribe of Levi, but they are not considered to be one of the multitude of nations. They belong to God. So now we're ready to move on. And we're going to pick up where we left off last time, which is verse number 8. But I'm wanting to go through chapter 48, paragraph by paragraph, rather than verse by verse. So let's read verses 8 through 11. Then Jacob looked over at the two boys. What two boys are we talking about? Manasseh and Ephraim. Remember, Jacob was failing, and he was failing fast. The word got out to Jacob, so Jacob came with his two sons. So he's now in the tent. Those are the two boys. Then Jacob looked over at the two boys. Are these your sons, he asked. Yes, Joseph told him. These are the sons God has given me here in Egypt. And Jacob said, bring them closer to me so I can bless them. Jacob was half blind because of his age and could hardly see. So Joseph brought the boys close to him and Jacob kissed and embraced them. Then Jacob said to Joseph, I never thought I would see your face again, but now God has let me see your children too. 
Now, when Jacob asked Joseph, are these your two boys, it wasn't because he didn't know them, it's because he was half blind. And what it means by half blind is he had cataracts. So he had these black spots that were there and he didn't see very well because of that. In fact, the Hebrew is kind of interesting, but it means it's weak. In other words, he wasn't getting the full vision, which means that he had cataracts. But he knew who they were, he just couldn't see them. But that little bit of information explains what happens next. Look at verses 12 and 13. Joseph moved the boys who were at their grandfather's knees, and he bowed with his face to the ground. Then he positioned the boys in front of Jacob. With his right hand, he directed Ephraim toward Jacob's left hand, and with his left hand, he put Manasseh at Jacob's right hand. So Joseph is steering Ephraim toward Jacob's left hand, and he's steering Manasseh toward jo Joseph's right hand. Now, does anyone know why Joseph was doing that? Anyone know? It's because Jacob's going to bless them. But more importantly, he's going to designate which one of them is going to receive the birthright. And the one receiving the birthright will receive the blessing from Jacob's right hand. Now, let me stop here for a second before we go on. And let me explain a few things about the birthright. Remember, chapter 48 provides many of the keys that unlock the mysteries to the Old Testament. So if you don't understand chapter 48, as you're reading through the Old Testament, you get lost. It doesn't make sense. So I want to slow down just a bit and explain a little bit about the birthright. The birthright normally went to the firstborn. And the birthright bestowed two honors upon the recipient. First, they received a double portion of the inheritance. Now, that was for practical purposes. You see, with the privilege of receiving the birthright came responsibility. And part of that responsibility was taking care of every single female family member. If they weren't married, they were your responsibility. So they were responsible for their widowed mother and any of the single sisters that they might have. And that's, that's why they received a double portion of the inheritance. It wasn't just so they could be blessed. It's because they inherited the responsibility of the single family members that were female. Secondly, this is the second honor, they became the undisputed leader of the family. Those were the two honors. Now, with Abraham's family, things changed a little bit because God had special plans for Abraham's family. The two honors that I, uh, that I just got through telling you about went to any family that lived in the Middle East at the time of Abraham. So when we talk about the birthright, this just wasn't something that was biblical. Any family that lived in the Middle East at that time actually had the birthright go to the firstborn son unless he was disqualified. But with Abraham, God had special plans. And as a result of that, a third honor was bestowed upon them. And it all goes back to the first messianic prophecy concerning the seed of the woman. In other words, the Messiah who would come to save the world from their sin. You see, God promised Abraham that the seed of the woman, the Messiah, would come from one of his descendants. If you remember, we studied this in Genesis chapter 22, verse number 18. Go ahead and turn back there. Let me read it to you. And through your seed, talking to Abraham... All the nations of the earth will be blessed. Not just all of your nations. All of the nations of the earth will be blessed. Because you have obeyed me. Now, the word seed is singular in the original Hebrew. And I want you to notice what Paul has to say about this in the New Testament. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verse number 16. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say into seeds, meaning many people. Remember, it's singular in the original Hebrew. If you decline it from Zerah, it's not plural, it's singular. So he says, Scripture does not say into seeds, meaning many people, but into your seed, meaning one person who is who? Christ. Christ is not a name, Christ is a title. Christ, Christos, means anointed one. It's a messianic title. So he says this seed is not plural, talking about many people will bless these nations. It's talking about seed, singular, one person. That one person is the Messiah. So, when, so God promised Abraham that the seed, who is the Christ, the Messiah, would come through one of his descendants. So in Abraham's family, the birthright bestowed a third honor upon the recipient. And does anyone know what the third honor is? 
The first honor is what? Double portion. Second honor is what? Undisputed leader of the family. What's the third honor? It was the honor of being the ancestor of the Messiah. In other words, the Messiah would come through one of his descendants. So when Isaac received the birthright rather than Ishmael, it meant that the Messiah would come through one of Isaac's descendants, not Ishmael's. And when Jacob received the birthright rather than Esau, it meant that that, uh, the Messiah would come through one of Jacob's descendants, not Esau's. But that changes when we get to Joseph. You see, Joseph received the birthright, which meant that he was designated to be the leader of the family, and he received a double portion of the inheritance, which was graciously given to each one of his oldest sons, but he didn't receive the third honor. That honor went to Judah. Look at 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. The oldest son of Israel was Reuben, but since he dishonored his father by sleeping with one of his father's concubines, his birthright was given to the sons of his brother Joseph. Now, He was disqualified because of character issues. So the birthright was given to the sons of his brother Joseph. For this reason, Reuben is not listed in the genealogical record as the firstborn son. The descendants of Judah became the most powerful tribe, and they provided a ruler for the nation. But the birthright belonged to who? The birthright belonged to who? Joseph. So for the sake of repetition, who received the birthright? Joseph did, but he didn't receive the honor of having the Messiah come through one of his descendants. That honor went to Judah. Judah would provide the kings and eventually the king of kings. Look at Genesis chapter 49, verse number 10. In fact, this is the Messianic scripture we're going to be looking at Sunday morning. I'm going to go more in depth on this because this actually tells you when the Messiah will come. Yes, but... We're not doing that tonight. Notice what Genesis 49.10 says. The scepter will not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from his descendants until the coming of the one to whom belongs, the one whom all nations will honor. Remember, this one seed is going to bless all the nations of the earth. And here he says, the one whom all nations will honor. It's going to happen during the millennium. He'll rule over the world and then we're going to go into eternity. Who is this one? Jesus. Which tribe is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, going to come from? Tells you right there. Judah. So here's what we know. Joseph received the birthright, designated him as the leader of the family, which made the tribe of Joseph the leader of the other tribes. But there is no tribe of Joseph. Remember, Joseph's inheritance was divided between his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. So which one of them became the leader of the other tribes? The tribe of Manasseh? Or the tribe of Ephraim. Well, that's what verses 12 and 13 in chapter 48 is all about. And if you don't know that, you're going to get lost in the Old Testament. Jacob is getting ready to designate which of Joseph's sons will receive the birthright. And whoever he places his right hand upon and gives the blessing, not a blessing, will receive the birthright. And since Manasseh is the oldest son, Joseph steers him towards what? Jacob's right hand. Look back at verses 12 and 13 again. Joseph moved the boys who were at their grandfather's knees, and he bowed with his face to the ground. Then he positioned the boys in front of Jacob with his right hand, he directed Ephraim toward Jacob's left hand. Now, why, do I, why does it say that? Because he's a mirror object, or he's directly opposite of him. So if this is my left hand, then if I'm going to steer Ephraim here to his left hand, I'm going to do it with my right hand. And if I'm going to steer Manasseh to Jacob's uh, right hand, I'm going to use my left hand to do that. Everyone with me? So with his right hand... He directed Ephraim toward Jacob's left hand, and with his left hand, he directed Manasseh towards Jacob's right hand. But Jacob does something weird. He crosses his arms, and he lays his right hand on Ephraim's head, and his left hand on Manasseh's head. Look at verse number 14. But Jacob crossed his arms as he reached out to lay hands on the boy's head. He put his right hand on the head of Ephraim, though he was the youngest, and his left hand on the head of Manasseh, though he was the firstborn. Now, when Joseph saw what Jacob was doing, it bothered him, and he tried to switch Jacob's hands. Look at verses 17 and 18. 
But Joseph was upset. Why is he upset? We're going to see this in a minute, but we need to understand. If you're going to receive the birthright, you don't get blessed with the left hand. If you're going to receive the birthright as the oldest son, you're going to have to be blessed with the right hand. That's the prominent hand. That's the hand of strength. That's going to receive the blessing, not a blessing. The other one will receive a blessing, but not the blessing. But Joseph was upset when he saw that his father placed his right hand on Ephraim's head. So Joseph lifted it to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. No, my father, he said, this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. You see, Joseph wanted Manasseh to receive the birthright because he was the oldest son. And that's how it normally happened. And he thought that Jacob got confused as to which was the oldest because, after all, he's half blind. He, he, he has what is called weak eyes in the Hebrew, which means that he can't see everything. So Joseph thinks, well, he can't tell Manasseh apart from Ephraim. And that's why he's crossed his arms. So he says, no, my dad, that's not the, fir that's not the firstborn. So he picks up his hands to try and place them where he thinks they ought to be. But Jacob knew what he was doing. He knew which one was Manasseh. And he knew which one was Ephraim. Notice what he told Joseph in verse number 19. But his father refused. In fact, you don't get it in the English, but in the original Hebrew, he gets snippety with, with Joseph. I know, my son, I know, he replied. In fact, it really doesn't do justice. It's, I know, leave my hands alone. He doesn't say that, but that's that snippety uh, in there. Manasseh will also become a great people, but his younger brother will become even greater. In other words, the leader, designating the birthright. And his descendants will become a multitude of nations. In other words, Manasseh would become a great tribe, but Ephraim would become even greater in numbers and in prestige. And it would be the leader of the other tribes. And to emphasize, emphasize that, Jacob said that Ephraim's descendants would become a multitude of nations. Now, I want you to underline that word multitude because it is a different Hebrew word than what was used when God blessed Jacob. Remember, God told Jacob, I will make you a multitude of nations. And what Hebrew word was that? It was translated from the Hebrew word kahal. But this is a completely different Hebrew word, and it means something entirely different. The word multitude in verse number 19 is translated from the Hebrew word mellow. Not even close. You have kahal, and then you have mellow. Mellow means fullness in the sense of busting at the seams. So basically, what Jacob was telling Joseph was that Ephraim would be busting at the seams. They would be the largest tribe and one of the most powerful and the most prestigious, and it would be the leader. And when it's talking about fullness, it doesn't just mean in numbers. It also means in superiority. So this is part of the blessing that says that he will have the birthright. He will be, or the tribe of Ephraim will be, the leader of all the other tribes. Now look at verse number 20. So Jacob blessed the boys that day with this blessing. The people of Israel will use your names when they give a blessing. They will say, may God make you as prosperous as Ephraim and Manasseh. In this way, notice this, in this way, Jacob put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh. Now, what does that mean, Jacob put Ephraim ahead of Manasseh? Well, it means that Ephraim received the birthright, making his tribe the leader of the other tribes. Remember, let's go through this again because this is crucial. Joseph received the birthright, designating him as the leader of the family, the leader of all of his brothers and their descendants, meaning that his tribe would be the leader of all the other tribes, which made the tribe of Joseph the leader of the 12 tribes. But there is no tribe of Joseph because his inheritance was divided among his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, which meant that one of their tribes would become the leader of the other tribes. And that turned out to be Ephraim. So the tribe of Ephraim became the leader of the other tribes. And that's what it means when it says, he put Ephraim above Manasseh. And knowing that is crucial to understanding 
much of the Old Testament. In fact, that's one of the keys to understanding much that is prophesied in the prophetical books. You see, this explains so many things. It explains why Ephraim got so upset when one of the other tribes did something without consulting them. How many of you have ever been reading through the book of Judges? And one of the judges, God will rise up and they'll go do something and they'll deliver the the 12 tribes of Israel from one of the marauding bands or from an enemy. And the tribe of Ephraim gets upset. Look at Judges chapter 8 verses 1 through 3. This is a good example. Now the men of Ephraim said to him, why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? Now they're talking to Gideon. And they reprimanded him sharply. So he said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God has delivered into your hands the prince of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. Now we all know the story of what Gideon did. Man, he was the great deliverer. But here is the tribe of Ephraim and they're upset when the battle's over. They're mad at him. And he has to appease the tribe of Ephraim by saying these wonderful things about them. Why? Because they thought they should have taken the lead role because Ephraim received the birthright, making their tribe the leader of the other tribes. Now look at Judges chapter 12, verse number 1. Then the people of Ephraim mobilized an army and crossed over the Jordan River to Zaphon. They sent this message to Jephthah. Why didn't you call for us to help you fight against the Ammonites? We are going to burn down your house with you in it. I mean, that's really grateful for what Jephthah did. He was one of the judges. He helped deliver Israel. And how does the tribe of Ephraim respond? They're going to burn down his house. Why? Why were they so upset? Because they thought, as the leader of the other tribes, they should have taken the lead. How dare they not consult them? How dare they take the lead without coming and asking them to be the main part of it? You see, they expected the leaders of Israel to come from their tribe, and the majority of them did. Yeah. Who took Moses' place? Oh, come on, not a trick trick question. Who took Moses' place when Moses died? Joshua did. What tribe was Joshua from? Most of us don't know. He was from the tribe of Ephraim. Samuel, what tribe was he from? The great prophet that chose David. The great prophet. You remember Samuel? Wonderful man of God. What tribe was he from? The tribe of Ephraim. Most of the great leaders came from that. Now once we get to David and we start seeing those kings, it's different. Why is it different? Because the third honor of the birthright did not go to Joseph who had the birthright. That went to the tribe of Judah. And we're going to see in just a little bit that there's a little bit of contention and jealousy, strife between those two. But here's what I want you to understand. When the children of Israel went into the promised land, where was the tabernacle place? Do you remember? In Shiloh. And where is Shiloh located? In the tribe of Ephraim. The tribal land. Look at Joshua chapter 18 verse number 1. Now that the land was under Israelite control, the entire community of Israel. Notice that word community? The alliance of nations. They all gathered at Shiloh. And they set up the tabernacle there. Now. Why was it set up at Shiloh? Because Ephraim received the birthright, making his tribe the leader of all the other tribes. That's why. In fact, when the Ark of the Covenant is moved to Jerusalem, it produces hard feelings between the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Judah. You're not going to see this until later, but we're going to jump ahead. I'll show you this verse in a minute. But I want you to turn, if you don't mind, to the book of Isaiah, the 11th chapter, verse number 13. In Isaiah, the 11th chapter, this is in reference to the millennium. Now, I want you to notice when we get to the bottom of this, what it says. This is verse number 13. Oh, my. Really should bring out my glasses when I do this. Then at last, the jealousy between Israel and Judah will end. And they will not be rivals anymore. 
There's a jealousy between the two tribes. There's problems. You want to know why there's problems? Because the tabernacle originally was at Shiloh. But when David comes along, he wants to set up the place where God wanted the temple. And so he brings the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem out of the tribe of Ephraim. And people, that causes hard feelings. And believe it or not, that plays a role in the splitting of the kingdom of Israel. Do you remember when Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, became king? And the people asked him to lighten the load, but he refused to do it. Who spoke for the people? Do you remember who came and spoke on behalf of the people and told Rehoboam they want him to lighten the load? Jeroboam. And what tribe was Jeroboam from? The tribe of Ephraim. So when the ten northern tribes broke away, who was their king? Jeroboam. Look at 1 Kings chapter 11, verses 26 through 32. Another rebel leader was Jeroboam, son of Nebat, one of Solomon's own officials. He came from the town of Zereda in Ephraim. So Jeroboam is from the tribe of Ephraim. And his mother was Zeruah, a widow. This is the story behind his rebellion. Solomon was rebuilding the supporting terraces and repairing the walls of the city of his father David. Jeroboam was a very capable young man. And when Solomon saw how industrious he was, he put him in charge of the labor force from the tribes of what? Ephraim and Manasseh. He's from Ephraim. So he is over the house of Joseph. He's over all of those that are working from the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, the descendants of Joseph. One day as Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah from Shiloh met him along the way. Ahijah was wearing a new cloak. The two of them were alone in the field and Ahijah took, him of the, took hold of the new cloak he was wearing and he tore it into 12 pieces. What do they symbolize? 12 tribes. Then he said to Jeroboam, take 10 of these pieces for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I'm about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and I will give 10 of the tribes to you. But I will leave him one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem. Well, wait a minute. There's 12 tribes. He's going to leave him one tribe. you got the tribe of Judah. And what's the tribe he leaves? Benjamin. What about the Levites? They're not a nation, technically. So therefore, you have 10 of the northern tribes, 2 of the southern tribes, which I've chosen of all the tribes of Israel. Now, here's what's interesting. And this is where you have to change your mindset to understand the Old Testament. After the split, the southern kingdom consisted of two tribes, the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And their kingdom was referred to as Judah. And I'll explain why in just a minute. The northern kingdom consisted of ten tribes. And their kingdom was referred to as Israel, but there was another name that it's also referred to as at referred to as does anyone know what that other name is guess Ephraim from the time the kingdom splits into two kingdoms the southern kingdom is going to be referred to as Judah the northern kingdom is going to be referred to sometimes as Israel and sometimes as Ephraim Israel and Ephraim will be used synonymously Now, let me explain why they were given these names. The rulers of the southern kingdom came from Judah, from the house of David. So its kingdom was called Judah after the tribe that the rulers came from. The rulers of the northern kingdom came from the tribe of Ephraim. So its kingdom was referred to as Ephraim. So sometimes the northern kingdom, the ten tribes that broke away, they're referred to as Israel, and at other times they're referred to as Ephraim, and those two words are used synonymously. And you need to know that when you're reading through the Old Testament, because if you don't, you'll get confused. You get to the prophets, and it keeps prophesying about Ephraim. And you're thinking, what in the world does this tribe have to do with this? It's not the tribe it's talking about. It's talking about the kingdom, the ten tribes that broke away and made their own alliance that we refer to as Israel, but the prophets referred to as Ephraim. Why? Because the rulers came from the tribe of Ephraim. Why did they come from the tribe of Ephraim? Because Ephraim received the birthright. Now, 
Let me give you some examples of the ten northern tribes being referred to as Ephraim. Look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse number 17. The Lord will bring on you and, all, and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. Now, I want you to understand, it's not talking about the tribe of Ephraim. The tribe of Ephraim was not the only one that broke away. He's talking about Israel, the ten tribes. But he doesn't refer to them as Israel. What does he refer to them as? Ephraim. So it's talking about the ten northern tribes. And if you don't know that, right over your head. Now look at Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 16 through 19. Here's another one of the prophets. Isaiah is a prophet. Ezekiel is a prophet. Son of man, this is what God tells Ezekiel. Son of man, take a stick of wood and write on it belonging to Judah and the Israelites associated with him. So he's supposed to write on this stick, Judah. And then he says, take another stick of wood and write on it belonging to Joseph, that is Ephraim. Write on this other stick, Ephraim, and all the Israelites associated with him. So basically he says, write on these two sticks, each of the kingdoms, Judah, Ephraim. Judah does not just represent the tribe of Judah. Judah represents the southern kingdom. Judah and Benjamin. And Ephraim doesn't just represent the tribe of Ephraim. It represents the ten northern tribes, the alliance. Now notice what it says. Join them together into one stick so they will become one in your hand. When your people ask you, won't you tell us what you mean by this? You say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm going to take the stick of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and all and of the Israelite tribe associated with them, the ten northern tribes, and I'm going to join it to Judah's stick. I will make them into a single stick of wood, and they will become one in my hand. Now, how many of you know what Ezekiel 37 is talking about? The Valley of Dry Bones. God's going to take this dead nation that he's scattered all over the world. He says, in the end times, and we're living in the end times. I'm going to take these Jews from all over the world who's never lost their identity like every other. What are you, Pastor Allen? Oh, I got a little Irish in me, got a little German in me. But I don't think that way. I'm an American, but not Jews. Doesn't matter, they've been dispersed throughout the world for 2,000 years. In fact, longer than that because of the 10 tribes. 722, so you're talking 2,700 years through Russia, through Eastern Europe. All over the world, even in China. You didn't know that, did you? And he says, I'm going to speak to those valley of dry bones. And those bones are going to come together and they're going to be covered with flesh. And what he's talking about is, I'm going to bring these Jews to Israel. And he said, it's not just going to be the tribe of Judah. He said, I'm going to make it like it was before the split. They're going to come from every tribe, so you take two sticks. You take one, and it says Ephraim, and you take the other one, and it says Judah, and you put these two sticks together because when I bring the Jews back, they're going to be one people. They are not going to be two separate kingdoms. You won't ask, well, are you the tribe of Judah or Benjamin? No, you just want to know, are you a Jew? Are you an Israelite? And that's what took place. We're seeing it happen right now. Now, why would God do this? Because he loves all of Israel, not just the house of David. And when the house of Israel, Ephraim, was carried into captivity in 722 B.C. by the Assyrians, you remember the southern kingdom didn't happen until 586 by the Babylonians. But they intermarried. And they never came back. And so many of the people of the southern kingdom, wrote them off. They don't matter. But God said this because he loves them all. And they're part of Abraham's descendants. And he made a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And he will fulfill his promise. Look at Jeremiah 31, 20. Is not Ephraim my dear son? Now does Ephraim refer to the tribe of Ephraim? Or does it refer to all of the tribes that broke away? Not a trick question. It's not the tribe of Israel. 
It's all of the tribes that broke away. Is not Ephraim my dear son, the child in whom I delight? Though I often speak against him, most of the prophets went against him. Though I often speak against him, I still remember him. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. So again, this isn't talking about the tribe of Ephraim. It's talking about the ten northern tribes. Now, here's what I'm trying to tell you. When you're reading through the Old Testament, and you get past the place where Israel split into two kingdoms, from that point on, nine times out of ten, when it says Ephraim, it is not talking about the tribe of Ephraim. It's talking about the northern kingdom, especially in the books known as the prophetic books, the prophets. Now, let me give you one more scripture that has, scripture that has to do with the millennium. And this is where we're going to read that Isaiah eleven thirteen 13 again. But we're going to start. Yeah, now let's just read it again. Isaiah eleven thirteen 13, because it talks about what's going to happen in the millennium. But at the very end, it says this. Ephraim's jealousy will vanish and Judah's enemies will be destroyed. Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah, nor Judah hostile towards Ephraim. You see, the reason the Ephraim and Judah were always into it is because the promise was that the kings, the rulers, would come from the tribe of Judah. That was the third honor. The descendants, their, one of their descendants would be the Messiah. But the tribe of Ephraim was supposed to be the leader of all the other tribes. And what happens when you have two leaders? They're usually jealous of each other. There's usually enmity. There's usually hostility. And if you don't understand Genesis 48, you don't understand the Old Testament or much of the Old Testament. This is the key that unlocks so much of the mysteries. So as you begin to go through the prophets, every time you come to Ephraim, remind yourself that nine times out of ten, Ephraim does not refer to the tribe of Ephraim. It refers to the ten tribes that alliance that formed the northern kingdom and broke away from the southern kingdom.